The current situation in Alberta is um, frustrating and it's a little bit scary for those of us in the field. Um, we've had recent funding pauses and things are really up in the air right now. So I was an IV opiate user for about 10 years. During that time I, I knew harm reduction was important and I tried to be the person that was looking out for myself and looking out for my friends um, by accessing clean supplies and information about overdose and, and what to do if there is one. Um, so I really tried to be the peer worker from the beginning. Um, when I started to think more about recovery, um, I looked into the methadone program. And so over the first year, like it took me a good year to get stable, physically stable. Um, and then I felt okay and I didn't use opiates anymore. Um, maintained that level of stability for quite a few years and then decided that I wanted to come off of it. <clears throat> uh, so very slowly I started to taper my dose and to the point where I went off it completely. Um, around that time I went to school, went to college for addictions counseling. and. When they'd be teaching, it was very 12-step and very abstinence um, is the way to go about um, addiction. But I always knew that harm reduction played a much bigger part than, than I was hearing. Uh, so I tried to take practicums that were <clears throat> uh, a little more involved with, with the street-involved population, um, which led me to a job in harm reduction. And that kind of gave me this the strength, I guess, to, um, to keep my recovery up. So I've worked a few different harm reduction positions and in each one, like I, I'm learning and I can give back to my community. So it's been like instrumental in my recovery and staying strong. Um, as far as the overdose crisis, I mean, I think I've lost 40 some people that, that I've known that were close to me and it's, it's exhausting, right? But we have to keep going so that these numbers don't just keep going up. Two thirds of all North Americans struggle with some sort of addiction, whether it's shopping, overeating, being on your phone too much, gambling, sex addiction, right? We all use some sort of mechanism to deal with not feeling our feelings. And that's really what it comes down to, whether it's drugs, alcohol, you name it. And to, to judge other people, it's really not fair. And that's what it comes down to is, we have to come together as communities and support other people when they're struggling, not judge them. So for me, the, this epidemic is, is forcing people because we're attacking the people who, who've lost hope. One of the things that kept me going back out is that guilt and that shame. And what are we doing? We're judging people, right? I know I did it. When I was homeless and living on the streets, uh, I hadn't even recognized myself where I was at. I was staying in the drop-in and I sprayed the person in front of me because they smelled. 
oh, excuse me, can I have a non-smelling section? And I thought it was funny. I can't believe that I was that rude and that judgmental, that I would do that to another human being. But, but for the grace of God go I, that I had that opportunity to become homeless three times. Because that was a gift. I learned that I am no better and no worse than any other, anyone else. So it was a gift. And I hope that our city councilor, who called our harm reduction program a shooting gallery, may he be blessed with the same gift. I pray for him. I believe I'm connected to the opioid crisis by being a citizen of this earth. I've been given much, and I believe I have a responsibility to give much back. Personally, I am connected to this crisis because my son, Neil, died from fentanyl poisoning alone in his home. Neil hid his drug use for most. I have found, particularly in a small community, the stigma and consequently the shame attached to using drugs is heart-wrenchingly strong, demoralizing, and in effect has the potential to kill. Should my son have felt safe to be more open about his use, and should we have had a supervised consumption site in our city, he would perhaps still be alive. I advocate for the silent cries of the dead. I also advocate for supervised consumption in our city because I have been driven and taught to believe in supporting the vulnerable, the people without the ability to have their voices heard. Only about 20% of the people using drugs access supervised consumption sites in cities that already have them. And the people that do use them need to believe that their lives matter as much as anyone else. I also advocate in the hopes of helping other families avoid the tremendous grief that comes from losing a loved one to an overdose death, an unnecessary death. I advocate because our elected officials at the moment seem to be confused as to which lives matter most. The issues surrounding supervised consumption in our community and in others appears to be sliding into the economic realm of decision making instead of the health realm. Someone stated that our Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions is confused with his portfolio requirements. He is focusing more on whether the sites are acceptable to the community around them instead of the evidence stating that they are an important part of the necessary support for the crisis we are currently facing. In my opinion, it is unethical. I'm Jessica McEachern, and I'm a harm reduction worker in Calgary. My parents split up when I was about 16, and me and my mom moved away to another city, and that didn't go very well. About six months after that, I went to Vancouver because my brother and dad were there, thinking that I could like live with them, but it didn't go as planned. I couldn't live with my dad, um, so I became homeless and got into meth for about six months. And then I got pimped. <laughs> I got um, arrested. Like very, a lot of things happened within about six months. I got released out of prison, like jetted back here, and that's why I had a warrant in BC for so long. Me and the guy had a kid together. We were together for a few years. Everything was all good, and then we split up. And then um, within like a month after that happened, I went from zero to 100. I was like staying up for like two weeks at a time, like smoking endless amounts of crack, sex work, um, you know, extreme crime. Then I went, got in a high speed chase, went to jail for like almost two years, got out, tried for about a year in treatment, you know, go back out. And then kind of that same pattern for on and off for about two, three years. And then my dad died. That was when I found heroin. When I was really young, um, I was like, went through a lot of early childhood trauma. I was sexually abused between the ages of five and six. And I had a mother who was mentally ill. 
and a father that was an alcoholic. So when I was 13 and I did that first hit, it was like, I was finally okay. I ran with that for so many years. The heroin was like that times 5,000. Heroin was amazing. Like, I'm not even, I don't, I love drugs. Like, they worked very well for me. Like, my dad died, I was in extreme pain, and heroin was like a warm, they call it a warm hug from God or whatever. And it seriously was. Like, I felt, like, relaxed, finally. You know, I've been to more funerals in my life than I've been to weddings, and I'm 29. I think I've been to two weddings. And I know I've had 27 people in my life personally that I know that have passed away due to addictions or the lifestyle. Um, in 2015, my girlfriend, Brittany, she overdosed on fentanyl in her mother's basement. And um, you would think that would be enough to get me to quit using, but I left there and all I wanted to do was get high and I had a total disregard for my own life. And uh, I think I was using to die. Like that was the intent at that time in my life. It was just, originally it was like a solution. Like I felt at peace, but at that point in time, I just, just gave up, you know? I used to get high in the bathrooms over here all the time sit on these benches and, um, and use fentanyl, meth. And I come to these same places and I will find someone, I'll take them out for lunch and I'll talk to them a little bit about my journey and what brought me to where I am today. Um, I know originally I thought recovery was abstinence and I'm learning more and more each day that recovery is connection. In the last four years since I was an active user, um, the climate has really changed here um, for the better. Like harm reduction came to town in full force. Um, and the end, well, with the NDP being in, of course, it was like the first time we had a, a more liberal government in a long time. So yeah, things started to change really drastically um, in the good way. But then with the conservative government now, people are, emboldened to, to um, you know, come to city hall meetings and speak out about their property values. Um, like I said, like write petitions because they don't want community services in their neighborhood that they just moved into that those, those community services have been there for 20, 30 years. Because of stigma, people use and die alone. Um, people hide their use from people they love. Like Danny was in recovery and he had relapsed and he hid that from us. Had we known that he had relapsed, um, we could have been there for him, we could have helped him, we could have, could have found him in time, you know, that, that is one thing that I always have to, have to live with, that, you know, the way we conducted ourselves as well creates stigma. Even treatment is stigmatized, you know. Um, People talk about being clean and sober. You know, what's the opposite of clean? It's dirty. You know, our kids, they weren't dirty. Myself as a harm reduction worker, I have not had anybody say anything to me. Um, but I know the narrative is that we're enabling people. We're enabling people to live, essentially. Um, some examples of stigma in Medicine Hat, um, I've heard, let them all use the same needles and die. They aren't worthy of our tax dollars to help. Let's use the old arena in the flood zone of the city for the supervised consumption site, and next time it floods, problem solved. Perhaps my personal favorite, referring to people who use drugs as scab fucks. We as advocates have been told to get off our soapbox when speaking about the need for a supervised consumption site in our community. We have been told we are being too emotional and that it is unfair to the listener. I've had to endure being called a bad parent, that I should have done better. I should have dragged my son to treatment. I've been told I'm getting in the way of harm reduction workers by being so vocal. In effect, I believe, for telling the truth. The, the whole politics thing really scares the hell out of me, right? Um, I don't know what's going on. It's, you, you know, the conversations I've had with people It's not pretty. Um, it, it kind of, um, it doesn't seem 
like democracy to me. Not not in the way not in the terms that we used to know it. It's not a government I voted for. <laughs> but I don't know. Um, the stigma here is is that people are thieves. Um, and that they don't care about themselves and the community, and that's wrong. They do. There's a lot of stuff in Alberta that is working. Uh, we have several supervised consumption sites. We have really um, uh, intensively distributed naloxone, and that has helped a lot of people. We have increased access to treatment. So there is a lot of good stuff happening, but we have since had an election, and we have a new government, and they have paused uh, the supervised consumption sites that were already approved and were ready to open, and the other ones are under review. And there was recently a study in BC that showed that their death rate would have been 2.5 times as bad as they already are if it wasn't for harm reduction like naloxone, supervised consumption, and access to treatment. Um, and so my conclusion is in Alberta, if we are pausing or even rolling back on harm reduction, people are going to die as a result. Lives are at stake and people are dying right now in, in Medicine Hat, in, um, in East Calgary, in those communities where we don't have consumption sites at the moment, but I could have them ready to go if they weren't blocked by our government. So we are really, um, we are at a, in a desperate point. I mean, you're from Ontario, you know what the Ford government has done? to harm reduction in Ontario, not just to harm reduction, but that's what we are talking about here. Um, and we are really concerned that we will have the same kind of situation in, in Alberta where all the, what we have achieved, we should be ramping it up rather than rolling it back. Boy, I, I wish I wish the good times were rolling, and I could be like other governments and just try to keep everybody happy by spending infinitely more. But uh, I'm sorry, the uh, those times are, are over for now. We're broke. Supervised injection sites, just one public service some Albertans are worried could get the axe in tomorrow's budget. After a wage freeze last fall, nurses worry about more cuts. And doctors are already outraged that the government removed their ability for them to charge more for long patient visits. Uh, it, it's never been our intention to, to shut all of the sites, but we're taking a very close look based on the data. The Alberta government has officially launched its energy war room in Calgary. One of the first orders of business is to use two and a half million dollars for a public inquiry into allegations that foreign funded interests are denigrating Alberta's energy sector. Now, it means Premier Kenny and company will directly attack the funding source of nonprofit environmental groups like the David Suzuki Foundation. The war room itself hopes to collaborate with industry, academics, and indigenous leaders, and will consist of three units, including rapid response, energy literacy, and data research teams to generate Alberta's pro-pipeline messages through different media. It's an initiative not everyone agrees with. We, we've appointed a, an, a, a public inquiry to get to the bottom of all this, to look at all the evidence, and to shed some light on why foreign interests are spending tens of millions of dollars to attack Canada's largest industry. If we do not continue to develop those resources and sell them to global markets, then we cannot afford to pay for the world's, some of the world's best health care. I think access to health care, including things like supervised consumption services, are an essential health service. Um, it's been proven time and time again um, through peer-reviewed literature, academic journals, uh, that supervised consumption reduces the incidence of bloodborne pathogens, it reduces the incidence of infections, um, access to, to sterile equipment um, reduces the amount of time people are sharing. And so we already know that it's an essential health service and so it, we as healthcare providers need to be able to provide that service in, in every domain of healthcare. And so what we've done is we've sort of siloed harm reduction services or supervised consumption services into one kind of bucket where really it should be ex easily accessible wherever people are accessing services, whether that be a hospital, a community clinic. Um, it, it's part of the, 
the realm of services that we have defined as Canadians that we all have access to. And so just because a person uses substances should not prevent them from accessing essential health services. I think one of the things that you see quite commonly is that like we recognize and you see these statements everywhere that the overdose crisis affects everybody but how we treat those individuals who have overdosed or are experiencing substance use is drastically different. Um, so the people that are in suburbia still need supports, but they tend to have those more wraparound services there. They have that acceptance, whether it's from family doctors or from families, whereas you'll still get that one-way stigma to individuals who are then also experiencing the added complexities of homelessness or intergenerational trauma, et cetera, et cetera. And it's those individuals that are far more isolated and due to stigma either won't access supports or are unable to due to those systematic barriers that are unintentionally built into our, our systems right now. You know, you don't uh, check with all the neighbors to make sure that everybody's okay with the fire trucks going past at 2 a.m., you know? Like, are we really um, angering people? Is this inconvenient for you? Uh, because it's an emergency and you just like do what you gotta do and send the fire trucks through or the ambulance through and it should be treated the same way. We should just, we need these services um, on an emergent basis. And so to expect that everybody's gonna be happy when we start to do something different is never gonna be really realistic, um, but the expectations are far too high uh, and, and inappropriate. They're the wrong expectations to say, you know, we're gonna weigh out community needs the same as we're gonna weigh out people dying. It's just not the right analysis. It's inequitable in how we're approaching it. And in some cases it's unethical mm -hmm. because we have evidence-based research that's, that's very rigorous that shows that harm reduction, supervised consumption, is what we need and it's part of a multi-pronged solution it's not the only response but due to political ideology and other people's personal preferences or choices the evidence is kind of getting pushed against that what do i actually expect from people do i really expect people knowing what i know walking beside the patient population the folks that i know do I really think that um, everybody's on the same linear trajectory towards uh, abstinence? It's the right thing for some people at certain points in their journey, and it is not the right thing for others at other points in their journey. And we just, in true harm reduction, is to accept people where they are at and not limit their access to anything um, in that moment at that time. I am not, my job is not to put hoops up for people to jump through. My job is to help them where they're at. And so, and to help assist them in jumping through the hoops that we insist on continuing to put in front of people or huge high brick walls in front of people um, so that they can't access care unless they're willing to do something. Nothing else is like that in our supposed democracy. We don't have these sort of conditions that we apply to people like no wonder folks feel like they're less than right because they're made to jump through these hoops all day long my job as a physician is not to erect additional barriers and hoops is to help folks navigate that and to do what I can do in the moment and often that means um, making a prescription for buprenorphine naloxone which I've prescribed more of that medication than I have any other medication in my entire career. Um, so we're doing medication-assisted treatment that safe supply, absolutely. We should, this is something that physicians can do that nobody else can do, is making sure that folks who are using drugs are not playing Russian roulette every time they are doing that. I think just inherently humans will always look for something that is mood altering. Um, so I think sort of, there certainly are things that happen in periods in time that maybe change the, the strength or the potency of certain um, drugs, alcohol, whatever it may be. Um, but it has absolutely proven that this war on drugs is not effective. It is not working. 
really for anybody involved. It's not working from an enforcement, from a harm reduction, from a treatment and addiction kind of standpoint. It just, it doesn't work. So I think that we are at a point where we have to try something different. Um, does that look like a safe supply? Maybe, um, but I think what it does look like is a really a strong in-depth assessment of what is working. And there are models around the world that we can look to for guidance um, and you know, just to keep on doing what we're doing because that's what we've always done is not an excuse to, to do things differently. You don't need a lot, but you need a little bit of support, like nursing staff, for example. But I take care of folks on the streets, in the shelters, and in our harm reduction buildings. And absolutely, if I think that they're, you know, if they've had, if I see somebody in shelter and detox who's had, and this is not uncommon, who's had like six overdoses in the last couple of weeks, um, we're gonna try safe supply. We are absolutely going to try what we, whatever we can uh, to make sure that that person um, isn't at such high risk of death, right? Don't get me wrong, safe injection sites are super important. We fought really hard for them and they need to be everywhere. But, but when you have a safe injection site, when you break open that ampule of Narcan, you're doing an intervention which is in the last few heartbeats of somebody's life. And we need to do things that are way upstream, that give people the kind of lives that aren't going to put them in danger of a fatal overdose to begin with. And so putting safe injection sites there is important. Taking them away is irresponsible and, and, and ludicrous. And that's what uh, Doug Ford and Jason Kenny are doing. And that's why I say, fuck you, Doug Ford, and fuck you, Jason Kenny.